Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be reconvening with S.P. Muskowski for part two of our interview. This is our first December episode, and we've actually got a bit of a challenge at the moment, which I announced over on Twitter. Now, I don't normally plug our Patreon page at the start of the episode, as that seems bad practice, but today I am breaking that rule. I'm bringing some bad practice to the podcast because if by December the 7th we get 110 patrons, we're releasing eight podcasts in the month of December. Ordinarily it would be four, but we're going to double up. And if we don't quite get to 110, but we do get 105 patrons, then we're releasing six episodes, so it means a lot of content for you and a little bit of extra work for myself and Bob, but we're up for the challenge, so if you like what we do and you want to support us, it's just one dollar, www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And something else that we have going on at this is horror at the moment is our public nominations for the seventh annual this is horror awards. Now, all the information is over at www.thisishorror.co.uk but effectively, what you do is you send an email to awards at thisishorror.co.uk and let us know what your favourite novel, novella, short story collection, anthology, fiction magazine, publisher, fiction podcast and non-fiction podcast was. You can make two nominations per category and if you're a publisher then you can send in your works for consideration as well. Two works per publisher per category. And with that said, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Edited by Daniel Kayaku with an introduction by Jonathan Mayberry. California Screaming peels back to sunshine and palm trees to expose the hidden darkness in the brutal heart of the Golden State. Forget Sundridge beaches and shocker-given surfers. Think Eldritch River monsters and haunted ghost towns. California Screaming takes readers on a hellish road trip down the 101. From windblown deserts to the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains, E.S. McGill, Kevin Wetmore, Chad Stroop, Sarah Reed, Kevin David Anderson, and many more spin tales of terror that will make you rethink your next vacation. California Screaming is available in paperback and ebook October 22nd. So wax up your board and get ready to scream with 14 of the West Coast's finest authors. Coming October 5th, Deciduous Tales is a new literary journal featuring the very best in dark fiction. Join Richard Thomas, Matthew Brockmeyer, Douglas Milliken, Brian Asman, Josh Chaplinski, and more on a journey through the shadowy realms of literature. From horror and suspense to neo noir and transgressive, from classic creators to contemporary authors, Deciduous Tales is dedicated to highlighting the thought provoking, the scintillating, and the strange. Find out more at DeciduousTales.com or visit our Facebook page, Deciduous Tales, available October 5th. Get yours today. All right, well, that's enough of me rambling. Let's get on with the good stuff. Let's jump in to part two of our conversation with S.P. Miskowski. And now for a horror interview. Because you were talking about theatre, I wonder, what do you think... Are the strengths and weaknesses of plays, short stories, and novels. So, what can you and can you not do with each of those forms? Um, well, I had a friend, um, Willie Smith, who used to say that that he didn't think that you could do um, that you could get a sense of the ironic from stage work that that you couldn't get the necessary contradiction to indicate irony. Um, I'm I'm not sure that that's true, but I I will say George R. R. Martin was absolutely uh, correct uh, when he decided that the only way to do the stories he really wanted to do, the fantasy writing that he wanted to do, and not that I'm in, a Martin expert or anything, but um, that he he chose to go back to writing novel um, 
when he wanted to write about dragons, when he wanted to write, when he wanted to just let his imagination go and do whatever he wanted. One of the things you have to be grounded in if you're going to write plays is um, stagecraft. And, and I did study a little of everything when I was in school, when I was in graduate school. I did take directing classes. I took an acting class. I, um, I worked on uh, sets. I was a stage manager and an assistant stage manager and a production manager um, in addition to writing plays. You, you have to know what is physically possible. Um, if, if you're asking for a ship on stage, <laughs> you have to know how many crew members are going to have to haul that thing out. <laughs> yeah. And for some people, that's a great creative challenge and they love it because they grew up in theater, they find theater exciting and stimulating and, and those things are not daunting for them. And for other writers, for other playwrights, um, having to consider all those things is just, it just becomes stifling. Um, and you can really let your imagination go in fiction. You can, you can go anywhere, do anything. But um, film, yes, you can do anything, but it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, theater, y you really have to be clever. You have to understand how to approximate something. You have to understand how to create an analogy for something. You have to know how costumes are going to work. Um, the people I've seen who have been successful in theater are, are people like my friend Jennifer Jasper. She's been in theater all of her life. She started when she was uh, very young, a teenager, and she was always fascinated. She's always studied theater. She's been directing in Seattle for years. And she writes beautifully, and she writes um, plays that can be produced but not the way I was trying to write plays that could be produced. I was going about it <clears throat> in all the wrong ways. I was writing plays that were sort of well-crafted, and I was sort of, in a way, dumbing them down. And she doesn't do that. She, she asks a lot of the actors and the director, but she knows what can be done on stage physically. I, I think maybe the best playwrights come from acting and directing. I think you kind of have to be grounded in the physical world of theater to fully understand how it works and um, what's at the heart of it. I, I think that that was missing from, from my participation in theater. Right. You would almost think that, that to be in a, in a play, in a, in a setting, in a play, that it's it's an actor's interpretation, along with with the director, especially if if, if a director is doing someone else's play. Let's say that there's a published play, and it's it's their their interpretation of it. And to me, it's it's almost like you know I wouldn't want to if I wrote a play then I would have to be probably be involved in it because I would have to, you know, be able to go, no, 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 no. That's not how they say it, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and, you know, to a great extent, that's what happens, Bob. I mean, if you're, if you're dealing with a living playwright, it's expected with the first production, at least, that the playwright will come in and will be there for rehearsals and will be there uh, if the actors have questions or if the director right. wants to, you know, consult with you on something and that you will rewrite things as needed because some things are simply not going to work. There are some things that you could write on the page and they'll just be glorious. It'll be glorious. And you try to make it actually happen on stage and you can't. There is no way to make what you wrote happen on stage and you have to revise it. So that goes on all the time. And, and 
one of the things that I ran into is that uh, people were a little too careful with me. They were very considerate. Um, they were very complimentary and, and, and supportive. And I think I just never got the hang of the whole process. Um, I mean, I did it a lot. You know, I, I did it a lot. And I just don't think it was right for me. Um, I understand the relationship between an editor and a writer and between a publisher and a writer. That makes perfect sense to me. The relationship between the writer and the director and the writer and the actor and the writer and the designers, <laughs> it gets, it, you know, the director is the person who really has to be in charge. But the director is most of the time um, waiting to hear approval from the playwright that what they're doing is what they intended. And sometimes people can go overboard with that and ask you too much. They can say, you know, well, you know, we're not going to do it unless you're happy with it. Well, if you're an experienced theater person and you have a very good sense of stagecraft and a very good understanding of what's going to work, that might not be a problem. But if you come from writing fiction and you're doing this um, as a, as a, you know, as, as something that, that didn't come naturally to you or that you didn't do um, when you were very young, I think it's, it's too easy to fall into a trap. And the trap that I fell into was I wanted the actors to be happy and I wanted the director to be happy. And this goes back to what I was saying before about writing the kind of play I didn't want to write. It's not their fault I was doing that, okay? <laughs> That's not anybody's fault but mine. I started writing things that I didn't really want to write, but I wanted the people who were working on the plays to be happy. And I was trying to give them what I thought would make them happy and what I thought would be a good production. Right. And it was almost like you were seeking approval from them. Exactly. Exactly. And that's not, you know, that that's not the way to uh, write a good play. It really isn't. You have and then to you talk about, you know, but, but, not, you know, entirely, not entirely. And then you talk about, you know, how you have to know, like if you're bringing a ship onto the set or you're trying to make it look like a ship. Uh -huh. That's that's one of the problems I have with plays is because when they do things like that, it takes me out of the play. Uh -huh. Whereas if you have really skilled actors who are interpreting, you know, the play, you can almost have like a minimalist set Mm -hmm. and 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 get the same effect like prime right. example like bradley cooper's doing uh the elephant man uh-huh no makeup uh-huh you know very very sparse set and from what i from what i've read he completely transforms himself without makeup that you uh -huh. literally don't realize it's bradley cooper wow Wow. And that's that's hard to do. But that that just kind of, you know, he's he's skilled. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. And when you when you have that kind of synchronicity, you don't need a set. Mm -hmm. You don't need, you know, the 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 the, the buildings and all this kind of stuff. You, you just need a little bit of imagination. Right. 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 But I, but you still need to know what it's like working backstage. I mean, I just working backstage on crew gave me a lot of insight. Um, you know, I, I was the person up on a 30 foot platform making thunder and lightning in an opera. <laughs> I was uh, handling props and, you know, running downstairs and underground to the other side of the stage and back up again so that as soon as an actor arrived on the other side of the stage with a gun that they were using, that I would take it right out of his hand and know where it was. Um, you know, I, I just 
understanding what people are going to be asked to do. I mean, even if you're just saying this, this person shoots someone on stage or um, it's, we're at the beach, okay? It doesn't mean you have to create an entire beach on stage, but creating, even creating the sense of a beach. What elements do you choose? What do you choose and what do you leave out? And what are the people backstage going to have to do to make that happen? So I just think that if you come from that background, then you tend to be more inventive. If it's something that you've done and it's been dear to you all of your life <clears throat> and you then take up playwriting, I think that that is a more natural progression um, than someone coming in saying, I've been writing stories up until now and I would like to write plays now. Um, I think you come at it from the wrong end. Um, and, and I think that, that people who really love theater, if it's in your heart, that's something that you've probably been delving into for a long time. You don't just hop on the, the, the program, uh, you know, some playwriting program and say, well, I just want to be a writer. I think if you just want to be a writer, you're probably better off somewhere else. You're probably not going to be entirely happy in theater. But, you know, I wouldn't discourage anybody from trying it. You know, you should try whatever you want to try and see how it goes. But I found that ultimately there were too many people I wanted to please. There were too many people involved that I wanted to. <clears throat> I wanted to see them thrive. I wanted to see them excited about what they were doing. And so um, I'm better off if I'm working on something alone and then the person that I'm talking to is an editor. I understand what the editor says to me. I know what I need to do. I know how to have that discussion with an editor. And um, so that's what comes naturally to me. Well, that's good because that has completely discouraged me from writing plays, oh, no, no. <laughs> which, is, which is a good oh, no. thing. It's it's a good thing because there was a time probably a couple of years ago where I, uh, I thought, well, man, you know, I write dialogue really good. I'm not trying to brag. It's just, I know I do because I've, mm -hmm. I've worked on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, golly, I could probably write a play and have it produced. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what else would I need to know? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> right, right. Right. I was like, oh, wait, this is a research thing. And uh, I'm just going to write. Well, you know, hey, you meet the right director and the right actors. And, you know, actors, damn, they'll do anything. OK, I love them. They're they're just crazy. They'll they'll try oh. anything. They'll they'll do it. And um, and if it's possible to make it work, they'll make it work. But, uh, yeah, I found it. It, it wasn't really it wasn't what I should have been doing. And I spent a lot of time in it when I should have walked away um, much sooner. But I wouldn't discourage you from trying it. But I know what you're saying about thinking, well, okay, there's a lot of dialogue. Well, there are a lot of plays that don't have any dialogue. I mean, not a lot, but there are plays that don't have any dialogue. There are plays that are very powerful images. And um, it's, you know, it's something to try if you're really interested in it. But I found it wasn't right for me. Well, I can see how writing plays has definitely paid off in your own writing. I like feel in your in your short story collection. I feel you that had, it has. Yeah, you got you your first story AGA mm -hmm. in your collection. Mm -hmm. It's almost all dialogue. Yeah. Right, and it's like you know, years ago, you know. Uh, when I was, you know, with the Writers Guild, I remember one one of the writer guests that we had at one of the guild meetings said, that, you know, you never really want to have, you know, you don't want to do a story with just two people in one room. Right. Because it gets boring. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuck with me. And then, so here's his first story, and it's two people in, in, in this one room. And yeah. they never leave. Yeah. And, there is, and it's mostly dialogue. And it and it was, and it's like, God damn, this thing is good. <laughs> it's like Thank you just you. broke like a rule somewhere. There's some, there's some, you know, 
eviction rule guy going, no, no, <laughs> you can't do this, you know, and you did it. And it's like, damn. Thank you. And that was very, very powerful start to the, to the uh, collection there. That was a conscious attempt to do exactly that. I, it was, um, and I, and like you, Bob, uh, one of my strong points has always been dialogue. Um, dialogue has never been that hard for me. And so I just wondered if I could get away with it. You know, could I create enough atmosphere? Could I create enough backstory through the stories that this guy was telling to the other guy? Could it start to creep up on the reader? And, you know, just that, that, that time, those little, how much, how little could I do? How little could happen around these guys? Um, and still feel menacing, right? So, I, I mean, I didn't do it just purely as an experiment. I had the idea first, but then I thought, God, I wonder if I could get away with this. And so I did decide that I was going to do as little as possible um, outside of the dialogue, outside of these guys talking to one another, catching up with one another. Um, you see the, the waitress interact with them a little bit, but she doesn't right. say anything. You see the bartender, and his behavior is a little odd, but he doesn't say anything. Um, there's something going on outside the the window, you know, and that kind of changes and starts to develop a little bit over the course of the story. But I just wanted to see if it was possible to build in enough um, about this story that this guy was telling to the other guy to make it to make it creepy and make it menacing. And I'll tell you something. Um, there's a play called uh, by Connor McPherson's. Uh, it's called The Wear. And boy, is it scary. And it's just like five or six people in a bar telling one another stories. There's just that the set never changes. It's just a, a newcomer to the to this village, to this town. And these guys who are locals. And one of them, I think one of them sold her, sold the newcomer her house. And it's nothing but these guys telling each other stories. And it is terrifying. It's one of the scariest things I've ever read. Um, so that was kind of an experiment. But, I, but I, I'm very pleased to hear you say that, Bob. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, no, glad, no problem. I'm glad it worked for you. <laughs> It was. It's actually inspirational. It's helping. It, reading that is a, actually is helping me with a particular difficult short story I've been working on. Oh, good. That's great. So, and it, it, it it's very inspirational. What was the name of that play that you mentioned with the bar? It sounds like the Chowder Society in a bar. And yeah, it's like you know, I want to no, read that now. <laughs> it's it's the where um, W. E I R and the the playwright is Connor McPherson, and um, okay. he he's he's written a lot of plays, um, but that one really did it for me. That one's uh, that was very very disturbing. Um, yeah, and and they're not they're not all made up stories. I mean, they're they're telling one another things that happened to them or that they that they've heard about. And, um, yeah, check that out and, and read it. It's, it's a wonderful, scary, scary play. And, and if it's directed well, it really doesn't matter that it's a one set play and that, that these people are just talking to, telling one another stories and that they don't go anywhere. It, it can be really terrifying. No, I'm it's definitely going to have to check it out. It's all, you know, it's all in whether or not the director knows how to orchestrate that thing. Right. Well, I'm definitely going to have to check it out. I'm looking at it now, and and it looks amazing. And the critical response, you couldn't really ask for anything better. I mean, mm. won mm. the Laurence Olivier Award for Best New yeah. Play. Um, yeah. Voted as one of the hundred most significant plays of the 20th century <laughs> in a poll conducted by the Royal National Theatre. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in that one, it tied a 40th place with Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh. 
Wow. Samuel Beckett's <laughs> Endgame and Arthur Miller's A View from the Bridge. I mean, <laughs> holy shit. And, <laughs> and I've read and I've read all of those and I've seen most of them. And I would recommend the wear first ab- above <laughs> those just for just for sheer terrifying impact. Yeah. Um, yeah and and. You know, it goes against everything I said about stagecraft, about, you know, understanding, you know, knowing everything about physicality on stage. And But I, I guess that's not really true, though. I think you really have to understand physicality on stage and understand music and lighting and, and design and everything to make that production as effective as it can be. But when you get it right, boy, that's a great play. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to seek it out, and Bob is too, so thank you very much for the recommendation. Sure. (laughs) No, definitely. Well, let's go back to your first novel, Knock Knock. I'd like to talk about the journey from writing it to publication to it being a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Award, because I understand it wasn't... It wasn't quite a linear journey. There were some interesting steps among the way. Yeah. um, Well, I, you know, I I love, uh, I'll start by going way back. I developed this great interest in Japanese horror films. Um, A friend of mine in Seattle kept recommending them to me. And then he recommended um, a couple of Korean horror films, and I loved those too. And um, they really had a strong uh, impact on me. I kept taking his suggestions, his film suggestions, and and he, and this one uh, film that he recommended was called um, Nang Nak, and it was. Um, a Thai film based on um, a very famous legend about this young couple, um, this young bride who um, went to her husband's village to live with her, to live with him, and was very out of place there. <clears throat> and she didn't, she didn't feel comfortable except you know, sort of living through him in this village. And she became pregnant, and um, he was called away to war. He was, uh, he had to enlist and go away. And she was left all alone, pregnant, in this village with none of her own friends or family, and trying to make her way among these people who sort of, they didn't look down on her, but they just found her sort of strange and they didn't try to connect with her. So the husband goes away to war. He has a minor injury and he's sent home. He comes back home and he goes back to his house and he finds that his wife has had their baby and she's happy to see him and he loves her, he loves the baby, he's so glad to be home, and things start going back to normal. But he finds every time he goes into the village or every time he takes a walk, every time he goes anywhere, the villages, the villagers r- regard him in a strange way. They don't make contact with him. They stand back and they sort of look at him in a, in a way that makes him feel like they don't want him there. And finally, he confronts someone that he knows. He, he confronts an old friend and he says, <clears throat> you know, what is it? What is wrong with everybody? Why are people being so unfriendly? And the man says, while you were away, your wife died in childbirth and what you're living with is not your wife um and the child is not your child and the man won't believe him he thinks this is this is insane 
you know, it's, it's a prank. Why are people behaving this way? But the, the friend convinces him that if he sneaks up on his wife, if he goes around the back of the house and he looks at her through a window when she doesn't know he's watching her, then he will see what she is really like. So he does this. And when he looks through the window, he sees this demon, this horrifying creature. And she reaches across the room and her arm just stretches out to six feet to grab hold of something. And the baby, what he thought was his baby, is nothing but this this afterbirth, this bloody pile of cloths. And so... There's more to the story. He he tries to, you know, have her soul put to rest by the the local um, religious man, the the a monk who is who lives in the village. But that was the main part of the story that fascinated me, <clears throat> and that was what sort of started. I I just became obsessed with it. And I wanted to tell that story in my own way. Now, this, now this has been made into films, TV shows. It's been adapted in stories and novels many, many times. Um, this is a famous legend in Thailand. But I, I mean, was a famous le- uh, legend in Thailand. But I, I couldn't find the exact way that I wanted to tell it. So, (laughs) later, my husband and I were visiting his grandmother in um, Kelso, Washington, which is uh, in the southwest corner of Washington State. And it's one of those places that um, it it gets very dark at night. It gets, you know, very um, sort of a little creepy. It reminded me of my childhood when I used to visit my grandparents in the country. And it was so dark outside that if you looked out a window, you couldn't see outside. You you know, if the the light was on, you could only see yourself. You could only see your reflection. And I always found it very, um, not frightening, but a little disturbing and creepy when I stayed with my grandparents. And this reminded me of that. And before we went to bed, um, I was talking with Corey's grandmother, and she was telling lots of stories. She was a great storyteller, a wonderful woman named Carolee. And she was talking about her neighbors down the road and how they like to go out at night and shoot their guns. <laughs> and they would get, you know, they drink too many beers, and they go outside and shoot their guns. And, and I said, well, why? Why do they? Why? <laughs> she would say, I have no idea. I, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? And she was a very educated woman and a smart lady. And I started thinking, this is so strange to live in a tiny house like this in the dark night in the country with people out there that you don't really fit in with socially. You don't quite, you know, you don't quite understand them. And then then Nong Nok came back to me. And my husband and I went to bed. He fell asleep immediately. I tried to fall asleep and I couldn't. And I couldn't. And I had a bout of insomnia. And so I didn't, I didn't know what to do. There was nothing. I didn't want to wake anybody up watching TV or listening to music. So I got out my notebook and I just started making notes. I just started you know, sketching things out. And somehow the idea of Nang Nak and this elderly woman living in the country alone started to come together and form a different story. Um, Nang Nak kind of fit, was kind of compartmentalized into the, the last portion of the story. But leading up to it were all these other characters um, and I just kept writing and writing. And by about four in the morning, I had sketched out what would eventually become a novel. 
would become knock, knock, knock. And um, I, I just realized that it couldn't be told in a story. It, ha it, it actually would have to be a novel. And rather than finding that daunting, I found that every time I sat down to think about it or work on it or make notes, all this new material just came pouring out. There was more and more and more. And then the issue came, became trimming it down, you know, m making it all fit together in, an, in a story that would flow. And I started thinking about the mythology of a place like that. Okay, there are legends in every place. Every place has its own legends. What would be the legends of this place, this fictional town? And, um, and it just went from there. So it, eventually I had um, chapters. I had enough of a novel. And so I joined this, um, this writing group online where people would trade chapters and give one another critiques because I thought I needed some feedback. I, I needed to know what I was doing. I mean, it, I, it appealed to me, but is it working, right? So um, I traded with people and they gave me feedback and it looked like it was actually fairly compelling, like people found it interesting. And um, I thought, God, I, I really don't know if people are gonna read a whole book about this kind of mousy, unhappy um, woman, middle-aged woman and her middle-aged girlfriends living in this really dull town. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But people found it interesting. The people I, I traded with found it interesting. So I just kept going. I kept working on it. And eventually the book was completed at that point, a friend of mine, um, I'm telling you the whole story of this, just so that people can see how complicated this kind of thing can be mm. and that it, it still turn out to be published and you know do okay and everything. Um, a friend of mine who is a wonderful writer, <clears throat> Suzanne Morrison, um, who is the author of uh, a terrific, uh, hilarious memoir called Yoga Bitch, um, she introduced me to her agent and on the basis of knock knock, uh, her agent, um, took me on and, um, she is still, she is still my agent. She took the book to some publishers and there were several, uh, you know, pretty big publishers that liked it. There were editors there who liked it who found the story interesting and engaging, but they didn't have any idea how to market it. Is it just a horror novel? It's not, it's not quite like a, uh, a formula horror novel. Um, it's not redemptive either. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it, it's, hmm. Is it a woman's story? Is it uh, literary fiction? It seems to be all of these things, but I don't have a category for it. So we heard this enough that my agent finally said, I think you're gonna need to find a small press publisher for this. Later on, we can try to market uh, what you're doing to bigger publishers as you go along. But why don't you put this novel up on Amazon as an ebook and let all the people you know um, link to it. Let everybody you have met so far online, because she also told me to go online and set up a website and join Facebook and Twitter <laughs> and all of mm. these things and, you know, get out there and meet people. Um, so I did that. And, by then I had met quite a few people and she said, okay, publish this as, a, as an ebook and let's see what happens. Let's see if somebody bites. And I put it up as an ebook and almost immediately Kate Jones from Omnium Gatherum wrote to me and said, 
do you have a publisher for the print edition of this? And I said, no, I'm, I'm looking for a publisher for the print edition of this. And she said, I would really like to, I would like to publish the, the novel. And do you, are there, is it a part of a series? And I said, no, it's a standalone novel, but I have all these notebooks full of material I couldn't put in the novel, okay? I couldn't form this particular story arc using all that extra material. And I, you know, we talked about it for a little while, and it seemed that there was enough material there for three novellas related to the novel. So she said, I want to publish those, and I will... You know, I'm going to publish the ebooks and the print editions of these, and that's what she did. And um, and she sent the book around to different places. Um, she got a lot of people at the Horror Writers Association to to read the novel, and um, got some reviewers to to take a look at it. And I sent it out to some reviewers, and and they were enthusiastic. Um, and then she submitted it for the Shirley Jackson Awards. And we just said, hey, you know, what the hell, right? <laughs> just try everything. Is it, going back to what John Langan said, aim high, go for it, whatever, you know, sure, send your book to the Shirley Jackson Awards. And, um, and to our amazement, <laughs> well, not Kate's amazement, because she always, always believed in the book and <clears throat> it was very encouraging, but to my amazement, it was uh, a nominee for a Shirley Jackson Award in the novel category. And um, then the first novella that came along, which was um, a prequel that uh, was about one of the characters in Knock Knock and her aunt who raised her and the grandmother who raised her with these sort of... Uh, magical potions and um, remedies. Um, and it was all set around this rock where um, for centuries, really, um, the natives of uh, this one area near the Columbia River used to bury their dead and they would bury them in their canoes. And um, this rock, once Europeans arrived, it was, it was ransacked and then burned. And then um, it just was destroyed over the years. And eventually it was blasted by this company that just uh, completely destroyed the rock and made it into, uh, you know, building material. And some of the buildings and roads of... Uh, of Longview, Washington, were made out of it. So that was the prequel. And then there was a story that was concurrent with Knock Knock, with the last section of Knock Knock, because there's a character in Knock Knock who walks out of the story, who just leaves. And, um, and you don't know for the rest of the novel whatever happened to her. So this next, the second novella is about her. You pick up where we left off, where she got in her car and drove away. And we follow her as she goes off to Astoria, Oregon, and she tries very hard to forget everything that happened in the novel, everything that happened to her and her family. And um, it gets psychologically and supernaturally weirder and weirder as she goes on this journey. And then there's a novella that is a sequel about a little girl who comes to live in Skalut, Washington about four or five years after the end of Knock Knock. And it's about her and about this thing that the little girls in Knock Knock accidentally unleashed. And it's not like this you know, big force that's going to threaten the universe. It's something very specific and very spiteful. It's a mean-spirited thing, an entity that 
worms its way in and tries to come back to life by taking lots of different forms. It starts with small forms like um, insects. It tries to express itself through birds. And it keeps moving up until, you know, it, it, you begin to realize that it's coming for this little girl. And she doesn't realize it. She just thinks she found this kind of strange thing in the woods. Anyway, so we ended up with, with a novel and three novellas, all of them related, and they all kind of weave together this much bigger story um, set in this, this town. And um, the, set, the first novella, Delphine Dodd, was also nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award um, in the novella category. Um, and that's it. That's my journey. <laughs> mm. Well, I think the initial suggestion of your agent to put the book on Amazon and see what happens was quite an ambitious one as well. I, I thought, this is crazy. Nobody's going to, nobody's even going to read this thing, let alone want to pick it up for a print edition and right. then publish it. And, you know, and, um, and I really didn't think I would ever get a chance to use any of the leftover material. I, I had all these notes and I just thought, well, <clears throat> I spent too much time working on this book. That's what, that's what that tells me. But in fact, there were, there were three novellas there. And um, so I hope, you know, eventually we get to do another edition of the novel and do um, an omnibus of the novellas, you know, put them all in one book. Mm. Thank you so much for listening to part two of our conversation with S.P. Muskowski. Join us again next time for the third and final part of our interview. Of course, if you'd like to get early bird access to that conversation, then support us on Patreon. And as I said at the start of the show, if we can get 110 patrons by December the 7th, we're going to bring you eight episodes this month. If we can't get that, but we can get up to 105, we're bringing you six episodes, so every patron really does count. And if you have a dollar and you want to do that, it's www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. All right, before I wrap up, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Coming October 5th, this Deciduous Tales is a new literary journal featuring the very best in dark fiction. Join Richard Thomas, Matthew Brockmeyer, Douglas Milliken, Brian Asman, Josh Chaplinski, and more on a journey through the shadowy realms of literature. From horror and suspense to neo noir and transgressive, from classic creators to contemporary authors, Deciduous Tales is dedicated to highlighting the thought provoking, the scintillating, and the strange. Find out more at DeciduousTales.com or visit our Facebook page, Deciduous Tales, available October 5th. Get yours today. Edited by Daniel Kayaku with an introduction by Jonathan Mayberry, California Screaming peels back to sunshine and palm trees to expose the hidden darkness in the brutal heart of the Golden State. Forget sun beaches and shocker given surfers. Think eldritch river monsters and haunted ghost towns. California Screaming takes readers on a hellish road trip down the 101. From windblown deserts to the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains, E.S. McGill, Kevin Wetmore, Chad Stroop, Sarah Reed, Kevin David Anderson, and many more spin tales of terror that will make you rethink your next vacation. California Screaming is available in paperback and ebook October 22nd. So wax up your board and get ready to scream with 14 of the West Coast's finest authors. Okay, and I'm back. And as always, I would like to end with a quote. And as I like to set goals at the start of the year, and we're rapidly approaching the end of the year, which also means we're rapidly approaching the start of another year. I thought it would be appropriate to remind you of this famous line from Walt Disney. The difference between winning and losing is most often not quitting. And that is Walt Disney. So hang in there. And I've really found that that applies to my fiction. And I've probably got more out of finishing 
a bad story than abandoning it halfway. And if Walt Disney isn't for you, then I believe that Chuck Wendig just said, finish your shit. So choose which one resonates more with you. Same meaning, different way of putting it. And on that note, I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror, and have a great, great day.